the Buddha said, one of the kind of shortest, pithiest teachings of the Buddha was, he said, in the scene, let there just be the scene. In the heard, just the heard. In the sensed, just the sensed. In the imagined, just the imagined. When we stay with our direct experience, without proliferating into commentary, discussion, projection, distraction, we come to certain insights, certain awareness, and certain clear seeing. We see that our subjective experience, our emotions, our sensations, our thoughts, our feelings, have the same characteristics as everything else in the world. So that the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations are the same as everything else. They have what the Buddha talked about as three fundamental characteristics. They're impermanent. They're continually changing. You know, the thoughts come and go, the emotions come and go, the body changes, the mind changes, the feelings change. Everything is constantly in a process of change. And that's the first of these characteristics. The second is that all of these experiences are unreliable. They can't be held on to. However much we try, we can't hold on to any of our experiences. They all come, they all go. Some last for a longer time. Some may give a long, more of a sense of security. But everything in the end goes. A body goes, a mind goes, a life goes, the relationships end. You know, everything goes. This isn't a pessimistic view of things, but really I think a realistic view, a realistic you know, experience of how things are. Because if we can acknowledge the truth, if we can take refuge in the truth of how things are, then we don't have to suffer because things are as they are, because things change, because nothing can be held on to. This becomes the flow of our lives. Oh, this is, this is sickness, or this is getting older. Okay, this is what this feels like. Oh, ultimately we might say, oh, this is, this is what dying feels like. This is what loss feels like. You know, to open in this way to our, our experience. So that's the second, that everything is unreliable. But, but if we come into alignment with these, the truth of these characteristics, then there's a freedom in relation to them. We can, um, we can as uh, one teacher, Philip Moffat, uh, uses in the title of his book, we can dance with life. We can dance with life. You know, life is like this, but we dance with it. Rather than fighting with it, rather than being in conflict with it. Life, why are you like this? Why are you doing this to me? Well, this is how things are right now. But if we dance with it, then there's freedom in relation to whatever the conditions are that arise. And the third of these characteristics is that they're... Um, the, all these experiences are selfless. There's no permanent self in any of it. Our thoughts aren't permanent. If we think our thoughts are ourselves, that's ourself. Well, the thoughts come and go. Maybe we had the opposite thought than we did bef you know, a minute ago. Which one of them is ourself? You know, are our feelings our, our self? This constantly changing body, is that our self? Well, the self is constantly changing. So... The Buddha taught that the selflessness of all of these experiences. And when we see into these truths, truths about life, then clinging falls away. So mindfulness becomes the gateway to letting go of clinging, to letting go of holding. It's the gateway to the end of suffering. Once we see how our clinging leads to suffering, then we let go of that clinging, like as though we were holding on to a hot coal, you know, a hot piece of coal. You know, when we're holding on to a hot piece of coal, we don't go, oh, oh it's kind of hot. Hmm, well, what shall I do with this, you know? <laughs> like we drop it, you know? Um, and when we see 
how our clinging leads to suffering, how the holding on, how contraction, how wanting things to be other than they are, how that leads to suffering. We let go. That seeing leads to letting go. That clear seeing. It's the, the Pali word is vipassana. It's what we call this kind of meditation, insight meditation. It's the meditation that leads to clear seeing. It leads to the end of suffering, to freedom that comes from this clear seeing. You know, I think of the example of, you know, giving up some kind of addiction. You know, once we've really given something up, and, you know, I remember I gave up smoking 30 years ago, August the 9th of 1983. <laughs> I remember it because it's my daughter's 11th, but it was my daughter's 11th birthday. But, um, but, you know, coming up to the 30th year, and we've all kind of probably given up something that where we were really caught up in it. And... You know, I think, of, I think of smoking now as I could no more kind of light the lighter and burn my hand than I could inhale a cigarette or kind of poke, you know, a, a something metal into my hand. It's like once you see clearly, you just don't, you don't want to go back there again. And this is the clear seeing that the Buddha is talking about, is pointing to when we, let, when we see into suffering, we see how... Our, our holding on leads to suffering, then we, and we let go. We see that clearly, we let go. That those are the second and the third of the no, Four Noble Truths about suffering. That clinging, craving leads to suffering, and letting go of craving leads to the end of suffering. And then the fourth Noble Truth is there is a skillful path of training that leads to the end of suffering. So we... So mindfulness, mindfulness leads to letting go, to freedom. We live life differently. We live life without clinging. We find refuge in the truth, in what is. We live in presence, in the, in the kind of loving awareness when we, when we find the end to suffering. So, So I was saying that the, 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 the current science and the ancient teachings of the Buddha and other wisdom teachings point to the same conclusion, that we can train our minds, and the science is showing that when we do train our minds, we actually change our brains, and that we need to change, train our minds. If we don't, then we'll continue in this kind of, in this um, wheel of suffering. We'll just keep thinking, oh, get more of this, I'll be happy. Get more of this, I'll be happy. And yet it just keeps us on the wheel of suffering. It's only when we turn the awareness, the, the, the spotlight of awareness inward, that we see that the actual problem isn't out there. It's in an unskillful, unwholesome relationship with our experience. So we need to train our minds. That's why it's important that we have a spiritual practice, that we have a practice of meditation, of training the mind, and other, other skillful practices. The Buddha said it 2,500 years ago. He said, nothing can do you more harm than an untrained mind. Not even your worst enemy can do you more harm than your own mind untrained. Conversely, he said, nothing can do you more good than a trained mind. Not even your mother, your father, your best friend can do you more good than a mind that's trained. And the Buddha provided a path of training to find freedom from suffering. It's a training known as the Noble Eightfold Path because it had eight limbs to it. And it involves a training I'm just going to name the three main areas. A training in the cultivation of wisdom. Seeing things clearly. That's what leads to freedom from suffering. It's a training in living ethically. Living a virtuous life. Living without causing harm to ourselves, to others, to the world. Speaking compassionately and wisely. Acting kindly and wisely. Living a livelihood based on kindness, compassion, wisdom. So that's live, the training the mind, cultivate, cultivating wisdom, living ethically, and training the mind through the practices of mindfulness, wise effort, concentration, focusing the mind. 
So I'm going to finish off just by sharing some of the, um, some of the ways in which the, the ancient wisdom and the kind of modern science have come together. The scientific studies are showing that we can train our minds and we can change our brains. You might be familiar with a study in the last couple of years where they showed that in just eight weeks of mindfulness practice, where people practice meditation for an average of 27 minutes a day, so eight weeks, an average of less than half an hour a day, this brought about physical changes in the brain. The gray matter in the brain became thicker in areas associated with positive things like learning and memory, self-awareness, compassion, introspection. This was particularly the hippocampus. So the area of the brain thickened in these areas connected with these very positive qualities. And the brain thinned in areas associated with stress and anxiety, particularly the amygdala, which is often called the alarm bell of the brain. If our amygdala is overactivated, we'll kind of be like that squirrel. You know, we'll be on the lookout, oh, what's going to go wrong and all of that. So th this, the brain actually thinned in the amygdala, thickened in areas that are associated with well-being and with more happiness. So we can train our minds, we can change, and in practice we change our brains. So even in the simple practices we do in meditation of noticing when we're lost in thought and coming back to the breath, or coming back to the body, each time we do that, we're creating new neural pathways, new pathways in the brain that are more helpful than the ones that we've been going down before, which keep us kind of lost in thought and speculation and memories and all of that. We kind of, those become less used, like a path through the forest, which we're not walking down so often. So it kind of, we're not, we're not using that anymore. It gets overgrown, doesn't get used. But the path that's more skillful, that's more connected with being present, that's what we develop. So it, this is what we're doing in meditation. In another study, they found that in just two weeks of training in compassion, cultivating compassion, compassion meditation, where participants practiced sending compassion to a loved one, to themselves, and to a stranger. Researchers found that compared with a control group, those meditating on compassion actually behaved more altruistically. And their brains changed in a region of the cortex that's associated with empathy and understanding and in other areas associated with positive emotions. So this was just two weeks of training and doing practices like, you know, may I be free from suffering? May you be free from suffering? May that difficult person in my life be free from suffering? Doing this for two weeks, they, they did some the studies where the, where, the, where the participants didn't know they were being looked at in terms of their particular actions, and they found that those that trained in compassion actually behaved more altruistically, and their brains changed, just as in the other study, in these positive areas, you know, associated with compassion and with positive emotions. So, what we're doing here and in these practices is something that, you know, is, um, is very valuable to us. Whether we want to you know, whether we want to see ourselves as finding, you know, as Arjun Chah said, complete freedom from suffering, you know, going all the way to, you know, letting go of all clinging, or even just letting go a little bit, or letting go a lot, that these practices are incredibly helpful for doing that. And the science and the kind of first-person science that people have been doing for thousands of years, you know, we, we know from our own practice, even if we don't get fitted with an fMRI, you know, to, to study the brain, that something is happening, that positive things are going on. We see it in our lives. You know, if we're meditating every day, you know, we see it in terms of how we're, the space we have in relating to other people. Perhaps we don't meditate for a few days and we see, 
oh, we're much, maybe more, much, much more apt to get caught up and, and angry when somebody says something or does something. So we know that from our own experience. We know kind of empirically. But the, the science is showing us the same thing. So to conclude, the Buddha's teachings rest on finding our refuge, finding our refuge in the truth, in the actuality of how things are, in being in alignment with life, with this moment as it is. This is what is, we call taking refuge in the Dharma. Taking refuge in the Dharma means taking refuge in the truth, the truth of our own direct experience. This is something I really love about this practice because it's not asking us to believe something. Oh, believe this and something will happen, you know, later in our life or in, you know, another life or whatever. It says, look at your own experience. Um, see for yourself what happens when you do this. Do you find that it leads to more happiness, more well-being? If you don't, then you can try something else. Maybe this isn't a practice for you. But if it does then the encouragement obviously is to, to deepen your practice, to continue to practice. So this is the choice that we face and this is what the Buddhist teachings point to is that when we incline our minds in a skillful direction, letting go of clinging, then we experience greater happiness. But if we get caught up in things that by nature, by their very nature, can't provide us with lasting satisfaction, then we're going to keep on going round and round on that wheel, thinking, oh, if I get this, oh, maybe, no, that didn't do it for me. Well, maybe I get more of this. If one hamburger doesn't do it, maybe six hamburgers will do it, you know, that we think, you know, just more and more will, will do it. There's a wonderful current um, Tibetan teacher, Minga Rinpoche, has a great statement about this. He said, he said, ultimately our happiness comes down to choosing between the discomfort of becoming aware of our mental afflictions and the discomfort of being ruled by them. So choosing between the discomfort of being aware of our mental afflictions and the discomfort of being ruled by our mental afflictions. So that's really the choice. There's discomfort in either case, isn't there? Because when, when we stay with our difficult emotions or our painful mind states, it's not an easy thing to do. Our minds want to go somewhere else. Let me have a drink. Let me have something to eat. Let me, let me uh, check my Facebook, you know, see if anyone sent me a message or whatever. You know, it's so easy to go somewhere else to avoid the difficult stuff that we'd have to be with. But that doesn't lead to lasting happiness, lasting satisfaction. It just leads to that continuous kind of wheel, of the wheel of suffering. So the choice of being with our difficult experiences, our mental afflictions, if we choose to be with them, then we can ultimately see their emptiness. They're not, there's not, they're not who we are. They're impermanent. They can't be held on to. And they, they come and go. And then, we, then we're not caught up in them. We're not in struggle with them. They come and go, they do their dance, and they pass. Our relationship with them changes. So this is our choice. Ooh. Let's finish off with a 30 seconds of just quiet um, meditation. and perhaps a koan. This is from uh, the Zen master Dogen from the 13th century. He says, to carry yourself forward and experience myriad things is delusion. That myriad things come forth and experience themselves is awakening. Carry yourself forward and experience myriad things is delusion. That myriad things come forth and experience themselves is awakening. 
So can we allow the myriad things, all of these changing experiences, to come and go and do their dance? And if we can just let them come and go, this is awakening, this is freedom. But if we get entangled with them and struggle with them and get in conflict with them, then we're on the wheel of suffering. So that's the choice that we have. And this is the choice of to take refuge in the truth, to take refuge in the way things are rather than running away from our experience. So thank you for your kind attention this evening. So um, have a wonderful week ahead.